they are projects they've been successful. So some of them, like I said, have not been successful. All these people, when they started that project, they did the evaluation, they realized that no, they couldn't continue with the deal. They just had to abandon the site. So currently in Ghana, we have three um, fields that are operating now, or producing now. We have a Jubilee field and an Ascent field. They are operated by Salo Oil Ghana Limited. And then the offshore casing for SSPA came online, and that is um, produced by ENI. Okay, so with our production, from 2011, we started producing from 2011, from the Jubilee field. Now, when you look at the graph here, from 2011 to 2016, this is how much we have produced in terms of uh, barrels. So, 2011, we started with 24 million barrels. Along the way, we were increasing. So, throughout from 2011 to 2016, the total amount of oil that we have produced is 193 million barrels. From 2011 to 2016, that's the total. Um, let me just say in this that from the total, the majority had come from the Jubilee oil field, primarily because that was the only field that was operated without producing. And so just recently in August last year, when the 10 fields came online, so Jubilee produced about 97% of our total oil production. And then um, 10 fields is just about 2.7%. Now, we also produce gas. When you are producing oil, there's something we call associated natural gas. When you are producing the oil, it comes, the gas comes along with it, so it's associated with the oil. What happened was, when we started from 2011, we didn't have any gas processing facility. And so we had to re-inject the gas back into the oil field, and sometimes we're flaring, we're just burning it off. But in 2015, we were able to finish up the extrable spam. Gas processing facility. Have you heard of extrable? That is our gas processing facility. So we started producing the gas in 2015. So from 2015 and 2016, we have produced a total of 97.5 million standard cubic feet of gas. That's how much we have produced just from 2015 to 2016. So, oil price. Now, this is very interesting. If you look at the graph there, you realize that the price has just been going down. When it started in 2011, the price was $113 per barrel for oil. And so along the way, you can see that it just kept decreasing. From 2014 to 2015, you see a sharp decline. $5 per barrel. And then in 2016, $46 per barrel. And this has implications for how much revenue do you get. As you see along the way, that revenue is a function of not just how much you are producing, but also the price of the oil. So you, you can't get much revenue if the price is low, and if you are not producing a lot. You get it. So this is um, the oil price that we see in the trend over the years, and then we see the education that has been to us uh, in terms of how much revenue that we've done. So our sources of oil revenue, where do we get it from? Now, GMPC partners with some of these oil companies, like I mentioned Carlo, I mentioned ENI, but when they produce, they have put in a lot of investment, but after that, they have to give their cost, they get their own share. But we also get, we as government, or government of Ghana, we also get our share of the, of the, of the profit. And this comes from different schools, or different sources. Some of them come from royalties, they are tax components that we put on the share of the oil that we produce. We call them royalties. Also from corporate um, income tax. The companies will pay income tax to us. And we also have what we call the carried and participation interest. So like I mentioned, we and PC partners with these companies. When they do, they have to hold certain interest on behalf of the government of Ghana. We call them carried and participating interest. So from that interest that they hold, they give us certain percentage of the oil profit. And so these are all the pools and the sources of the revenues that we receive. Now from 2011 to mid-year 2017, 
We have received 3.7 billion US dollars as oil revenue. None. So that's the total amount that we have received so far. 3.7 billion. Now, the trend of distribution and how we have utilized um, our oil. So let's look at the trend. 2011, I already told you how much we've gotten the total, the 3.7. But that 3.7 includes maybe up to 2017 this year. But now we are going to focus from 2011 to 2016. And from 2011 to 2016, the total that we have is 3.4 billion US dollars that we have received. And this is the breakdown. So from 2011, you can see that we had 444 million. Then we kept increasing. But then 2014, we had 396 million US dollars. Who can tell me the reason why it was decreased? Exactly. So because the price of the oil decreased, it means that it has a toll on how much revenue that we receive, like I mentioned earlier. So because of that, you can see that we had we received uh, lesser revenue than compared to the previous years because of the price drop. Is that the case? So in total, that is the 3.4 billion that we have received as oil revenue. So there is a framework that guides how we distribute oil revenues in Ghana. So as to whether you would use it for debt repayments, like someone said, we owe a lot, so we want to use it to finance our debt. Or you want to take the money and then house to house we distribute it. This is what speaks to whether or not you can do that. In 2011, we passed the law, the Petroleum Revenue Management Act. It was amended in 2015 to address some inconsistencies. But what that framework does is to spell out how we, we distribute oil revenue. So all the revenues that we receive, I showed you that graph from the royalties, the corporate income tax. When we get all of those money, we put it into a fund called the Petroleum Holding Fund. Now, so when we put it in the Petroleum Holding Fund, now I mentioned that GNPC holds certain interests on behalf of government. So they have to pay a certain cost, equity financing cost. So we give, hello, is everything okay there? Okay. So we give GNPC to pay up its cost. After GNPC takes up its cost, we also invest in GNPC. Now the aim is that we, it is a, 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 a national oil company, but we envision that in the future we want GNPC to stand on its own and even become an international oil company. Like the way we have these companies coming in to produce oil here, we want to see GNPC gain enough weight to even go to other territories and even produce there. So we invest in GNPC. So we've given it a timeline that by 2026, we will need GNPC off this investment. We expect that this investment that we are putting in GNPC will build that capacity and technical expertise so that they can also stand on their own in the future. So after we deduct all this and we go to GNPC, what is the left of the revenue before we call the benchmark revenue? Now with the benchmark revenue, we distribute it as follows. We take 70% of that, or not more than 70%, and we put it into a fund we call the Annual Budgeting Funding Amount, ABSA. Now the ABSA is supposed to go into the national budget. We we'll talk about that in a bit. But the rest of it goes into the Ghana Petroleum Fund. And that is all provided to two separate funds. We have the Stabilization Fund and then the Heritage Fund. Now, the Heritage Fund is to ensure it's a generational equity. So, oil is finite. It means that it will not be there forever. One day, it will run out. When it runs out, the future generation that did not need the oil, we expect that it will benefit from it. So we put in a fund that will ensure that by the time they come in and the oil is no more, they will also have access to the oil money. And so with that, 30%, how we share it is that the main 30%, after we've taken the 70 to the ABSA, 
we spend 70 percent of the 30 percent into the stabilization fund, and 30 percent of the remaining 30 into the heritage fund, the one for the future generation. Then the 70 that goes into the stabilization fund. What the stabilization fund is supposed to do is to cushion the budget against the so, like we have already seen, the oil revenues are volatile because the price itself is volatile. Sometimes it will go up, sometimes it will drop. And because we plan our budget or so we plan our development along how much oil revenues we receive, it means that there are times that we can get stopped. If it goes so low, we won't be able to meet whatever we are targeted for to meet our money in terms of the target. And so what the civilization plan is supposed to do is that in times of those stocks where we cannot meet our budget because there is still some kind of price uh, decline or there is some other macroeconomic factors, we use money from the civilization fund to push it the budget. That's the case. Then the heritage fund, like I mentioned, is supposed to be a source of pieces for future generations. So we invest these funds into financial instruments so that they can yield the next returns to us. But then the ABSA, that is what we are supposed to spend into our budget. So it's annual budget funding amount. So annually, we take money from the 70% of what we see from the benchmark revenue into the ABSA. Now the ABSA, we are supposed to use 70% of the ABSA to finance public capital investment. So we will delve into exactly what that means. Then the rest of it, the 30%, we can use it in the budget for other things. So, whether you use it for goods and services, it can't restrict it. It has a discretion of the minister to use it for budget needs. Okay. So now, let's look at our petroleum holding fund. So, like I said earlier, GNPC received a portion of it. So far, from 2011 to 2016, we've given GNPC about almost 1.1 billion US dollars. That's how much has gone to the GNPC from 2011 to 2016. Then the ABSA, what goes into the national budget? That is about 1.4 billion. Then the Ghana Petroleum Fund, that's the Heritage Fund and the Civilization Fund, that's how much has been received. So that's what gives us that total, the 3.4 billion that we received. This is how we have distributed it. GNPC, ABSA, and then the Petroleum Fund. Is that okay? Is that okay? Okay. So let's look at how we um, said the ABS. What the PRM is, the legal framework I mentioned, that guides how we spend the revenue. What it says is that we are supposed to prioritize not more than four areas of the economy when we spend the oil revenue. And that is supposed to be reviewed or revised every three years. So, from 2011 to 2016, what the government did, they prioritized four areas. We were going to those four areas. But after three years, they were supposed to review it. But they maintained those four areas. And the four areas, roads and other infrastructure, agricultural organization, amortization of loans, and capacity building. But this year has changed. When a new government came, they have changed the four areas. They maintained the agricultural organization, roads and other infrastructure. But in place of the other two, they brought in education. But we are yet to see how that will play out because that was just the end of the year. So that's not part of our research. We will look at for 2011 to 2016. But just for you to know that the priority areas from this year have changed. And we expect that in 2020, we might revise it or they will maintain it. So this is how it has been said so far. Growth and other infrastructure has received 1.7 billion. And from the total, 3.4. Then capacity growth has received 358 million. We will go into the specifics. So let's look at that now. Agricultural modernization from 2011 to 2016. This is how it has been spent. Now, the, the focus of agricultural modernization is to put in um, technology or adapt to new techniques that are modern, that's what good agriculture. 
and make it more productive. So we will spend on the number of programs for that, as you can see here. Some of it has been spent on fertilizer subsidy programs. Some of it has been spent on agricultural institutions. They build some institutions. Some of them rehabilitation. Some of them do on irrigation dams for a great laboratory. So these are the various amounts that they also receive. And that has caused all the uh, modernization over the years, 2011 to 2016. Now, roads and other infrastructure. I want you to pay attention to other infrastructure. Okay. Um, we've done a number of construction of roads. Some of them rehabilitation. Some of them were changing the surface to do cement. So you see here how it has been spread across. In total, about 160 um, road-related projects have received oil revenue from 2011 to 2016. So that's where we have uh, some of the upgrades, 31 roads constructed, they have been paid to 43 roads. They have received oil revenue. Now, other infrastructure. This is where it gets interesting. Because we say other infrastructure, it means that any other construction work or as long as an infrastructure. So this is where it has been spread over so many areas. Education has received some, health has received some, security has received some. So even though the priority area says four, and we didn't prioritize for education, but because of roads and other infrastructure, we end up sending some of the oil revenue to those areas as well. So, for example, when you look at educational infrastructure, we have built nine three-unit classroom blocks with oil revenue. We have built 127-unit classroom blocks with oil revenue. Laboratories, five, five resource centers, 107. So you can see how we have spread the oil revenue over this area and constructed so many infrastructure and education. Okay, so you see where the money has gone to. So when you see roads and other infrastructure, it means that it's not just roads, but education has also received the bit. We get it. Works and housing. Some markets were constructed from oil revenue. Some um, provided water with oil revenue. Office accommodation, sea defense for the coastal areas, the fishermen. They constructed some sea defense walls for them using oil revenue. Capacity building. That is also another interesting area. Because you find, when you say capacity building, what comes to your mind? Anything that can build the human capacity, isn't it? So that's also another big area where we can spread the oil revenue so broadly. So you see here, from 2011, we spent 750,000 Ghana cities on a capacity building program in oil and gas in KNUSC. Then it gets interesting in 2012. National Youth Employment Program, we sent from there, all the way to NADMU. We bought the new items for NADMU and the capacity building. And it will be interesting to ask, okay, NADMU, how is that related to capacity building? But because the area is so big, if you say capacity building, it's not so restricted. So it gives you for a lot of um, different sectors to see some of the oil revenue. So, like, for example, Nadu. He even sent money to creative industries, new digger, for capacity building from the oil revenue. And then some of the skill uh, training programs for disability in ICT, that's capacity building, sent oil revenue from them. So, 2013, this is what we also sent it on. Our agents tried to find some of the financial. And then Petroleum Commission. Do you know Petroleum Commission? So Petroleum Commission is um, a body that was set by government 
to regulate the upstream industry. So before you can even get license to operate in the industry, you need to go and get license from the foreign commission. They are supposed to regulate that industry. So they also receive funds for, for capacity so to build the expertise of their staff so that they can also do their work effectively. So 2015, again, you see how we spent revenue on capacity building, school feeding programs, DEC subsidies, SHS subsidies, all of that, strengthening and transportation, we spent oil revenues on that. In 2016, we spent majority of the oil revenues on the capacity building on scholarship calls. So we have people that we are trying to train them to gain expertise and knowledge in the oil industry because the industry is, we need technical capacity to be able to operate there. So we are trying to train people to boost local content of the Ghanaians being the ones um, taking up the exploration activities in the industry. So we spent about 83 million on the, of the oil revenue and the capacity building for that year on scholarships. And then the rest of it went to the funding for PIA, Public Interest Accountability Committee, which is an oversight committee that was set by government to manage or to supervise how we manage our oil revenue. So when you hear PIA, they are an oversight body to overlook how we spend oil revenue. So the PRMA says that they are supposed to be funded, so we spent this amount of money to fund them. Now let's go into the um, petroleum fund, the stabilization fund and the heritage fund that I mentioned earlier. So, so far, the heritage fund and the stabilization fund, they have received 800, about 800 million US dollars. That's how much has gone into it. But I mentioned earlier that they are invested because we want the future generation to um, have take of the oil revenues. We don't just keep them there, we invest them in financial instruments. So this is how much in this return we have received. 18 million from 2011 to 2016. But as of the end of 2016, we had just left 484 million. So it, it dropped down. So we'll look at why. So let's look at the breakdown. I've already mentioned that the petroleum fund made up of the heritage fund and the stabilization fund. So from 2011, this is how much it kept receiving. But look at the interesting trend again. In 2015, you see that it dropped. It dropped mainly because it was a drop in, um, this is for the stabilization fund, the one on the left. It dropped mainly because there was a drop in the oil price. And that means that our budget was in stock, so we had to withdraw money. We put in the budget. And from 2011 to 2016, we've we grown about 140 million. Just to put in the budget. Then again, we see the heritage fund, the one for the future generation. We realized that as production was increasing, we were expecting that the revenues will increase. But because of the drop again in the price, we see how it affects the revenue. So we didn't get as much as we got in 2014 compared to what we got in 2015 because of the drop in price. So the price thing is something that really influences how much revenue that we receive. So like I said, we invest them, so we are supposed to get some returns on them. And so far from for the stabilization fund from 2011 to 2016, we have received a total of Four million five hundred twenty-four um, Ghana CD as investment on it. Sorry, US dollars as investment on it. And then the Heritage Fund has yielded fourteen million. And this is interesting because the Stabilization Fund we've been withdrawing from it, so we don't have a lot of principal to yield interest. But you see that in the Heritage Fund, because we have not withdrawn, it keeps yielding interest. So that interest is more than what the stabilization fund is given. But like I mentioned earlier in the other one, because of the price drop, we could have gotten more if we had a higher price than what we have today. 
So that means that as the price increases in the future, we'll be getting more revenues. And if we keep investing it, we're expecting to get a higher net return. So, at the end of 2016, uh, what we had from the stabilization fund was 207 million US dollars. And then the one for heritage fund was 276 million. So that's what gives us a total 400. The total 484 million, like you saw here, is what has accounted for that. So let's just summarize all the plenty talking so far. Now, when it comes to oil distribution, so far from 2011 to 2016, we have produced 193 million barrels of oil in Ghana. Looking from 2011 to mid-year 2017. And we have received 3.7 billion US dollars as oil revenue so far. From all those different sources that I showed you, the corporate income tax, the royalty. Okay? But like I said, the 3.7 billion has to do with, we added this year, 2017. But the way we look at it from just 2011 to 2016, we have 3.4 billion. Now, like I showed you, and as the law says, Oil revenues have been distributed, so we take what belongs to GMP to GMP. ABSA has received this share, and then the petroleum holding mass have also received this share. But then when it comes to how the ABSA has been used, this is the dynamic. For the four areas that we prioritize, the highest has gone to roads and other infrastructure, and the least has gone to agricultural modernization. That's how we have spent it. But even though we said four priority areas, like I showed you, when you delve in it, you realize that the oil revenues have actually spread more thinly than the four areas. So other sectors have received it. So like, for example, roads and other infrastructure, we have spent on the construction of some classroom blocks and the education sector. So so many different, different, different sectors have received it. And so it has allowed for the oil revenue to be spread so thinly. And that is why you don't see the impact of the oil revenue so much concentrated in a particular um, sector. So at the end of the day, we spread over so many areas, you don't really see the impact because of so many projects that are receiving limited revenue from the same thing. Is that okay? With the petroleum fund, um, we started in 2011 with 69 million, but along the way we have a good net return. That's what I showed you earlier, the 484. So total with the net return from how much we have, after we have redrawn some, what we have left as of 2016 is 487 million US dollars. So that's the petroleum fund, the stabilization fund, the heritage fund. Together that's how much we have there. And we've seen how the growth rate has been slow, like I showed you, because of the change or the decline in the price, that's how much it affected it. So that means that if the price goes up, we expect to get more where there is a higher price because the revenue is a function of the price and how much we are producing. So the production, like we saw earlier, it has been increasing, but then the price, so because it has been going down, our net returns are not yielded much to us. So that's how much we have left for. So we can draw two main conclusions from 2011 to 2016 as to how we have spent our oil revenue. The first um, conclusion that we can draw is that we cannot focus only on oil revenue as our main source of funding for our development because it is a limited fund, like I said. What is important to do is that we have to diversify our economy and build other sectors of the economy. If we depend so much on the oil revenue, like the way we've seen, especially from 2014, 2012, 2014, how we're spreading the revenue stream over so many areas, we won't be able to get the impact of the oil revenue as much as we need for development. So at the end of the day, we'll keep spreading it from different, different projects, and then we won't see much impact. 
But when if we if we do if we do diversify the economy, then we allow um, other sectors to grow as well. Then we'll be getting more revenue from different sectors. We don't have to just focus on one. And the second one, which feeds into the first one, that oil revenue should be targeted, the spending of oil revenue should be targeted and focused. So we in ASEF we believe that even though the the PRMA says that not more than four priority areas. It is possible to prioritize just two areas. For example, if you take education and agriculture, you can prioritize those two areas, or education or in health. Prioritize those two areas for the three years. Spend on it, build that, those two sectors. Let them become very developmental. Then you can move on to other areas and, and build it from there. But if we spread it so thinly, at the end of the day, we won't get it. So thank you very much for your attention and if you have comments or questions, I just take it from there. Okay, so any comments from anyone here? Yeah. Somebody? Oh, no. We would want to take uh, your questions. We will attempt to discuss them. Uh, but I mentioned uh, before we started this program that we were having some international conference between uh, from 10th and 13th and 14th. Those who give us very provoking questions, comments, I'm sure you will invite you to participate. You will meet industry players from across the continent. It's free, you're not going to pay anything, we'll pay for your participation. And we'll be exposed to have interaction with the oil producing countries from the other countries, Nigeria, Nigeria, South Africa. So please, this session is an important session. Let's don't sit on any issue that is bothering you. No school fees matter. So I remember when we went to New House in Hope, Somebody, there's a place in the form. Do you have any form of disability? He clicked yes. Then state the type of disability. He says he can pay his fees. He's not related to what we presented. We don't have money to pay your fees. So we don't ask any question about fee paying here. So who, uh, uh, who raised, who are the first one raised that? Yeah, the back. The free SHS, people are still enrolling. It will be difficult at this point to get the exact amount. From your presentation, we realized that the prices of the oil, oil, actually, the fluctuations in the prices is, has a big toll on the revenue. I want to know some of the factors that really affect the prices, the fluctuations in the prices and how government has tried to tackle those factors to ensure that the prices increase rather than increase. My question is about modernization of agriculture. I think we've been hearing this for quite some time now. And before Ghana went into commercial production of oil, we've been doing modernization of agriculture. So I expect to see much when it comes to modernization of agriculture this time around. But I haven't seen much. Let's say, for instance, there is something going on like planting for food and jobs. I've only seen distribution of uh, fertilizer in seeds. So I want you to tell our authorities that when we talk of modernization of agriculture, it, uh, there is more to it than just distribution of seeds and fertilizers. And then, and then uh, affordable housing. Uh, We've also been hearing of affordable housing for 10 years now. But any time the houses are built, we don't see anything. If you take probably like teachers, for instance, a teacher in the village somewhere will not have access to it. It's only the elite that have access to it. So I want to know uh, what is wrong with that. Why is it the trend like that? The, the distribution of 
and affordable housing is very bad. I want to know the measures that have been put in place to hold, um, to make the people accountable for the money that they receive. I would like to know if uh, I would like to know if actually there is an organization that is responsible for the pricing of uh, the oil. Can I have your attention for the question for the Heritage Fund? No amount of money has been taken from the Heritage Fund for it. Now, in the beginning, government did say that they wanted to take money from the Heritage Fund to fund the free SHS, but we were advocating against it because our arguments, like we said, the Heritage Fund is supposed to be for intergenerational equity. So the future generation, they are supposed to benefit from it. So, so far, no amount of money has been taken from that. But um, government does envision that they would use oil revenue to fund education. And that is why we are looking at the four priority areas that they prioritize this year. Education is hard. So we expect that the portion of the ABS that will go to education will totally finance this um, free education. But we'll see how that will play out along the way. It, it can continue be, to be sustained from the oil revenue. But as of now, no amount of money has been taken from the Heritage Fund for the CSHS. Then um, there was something about the, what accounts for the prices. The fluctuation in terms of what will have to have toll on the oil revenue. Now, the play is it's an international market, so the dynamics there happen on the global scene. And government doesn't have control over the oil prices. We have what we call OPEC, oil producing and exporting countries. They produce huge amounts of oil. So when you talk about um, the, uh, Saudi Arabia and uh, Norway, those countries that produce a lot of the petroleum, they have significant leverage when it comes to how much oil price and uh, how much oil to price. Because they are producing so much on the international market, they determine the pricing. When they bring in their oil based on how much they are producing, they can determine, okay, we sell it at this price. There are so many interesting dynamics that go into it. So it's not just one country that has control over it. As the market plays out, that's what comes out of it. So government doesn't have any kind of control over how much except these as Ghana joins the OPEC and the oil and producing and exporting countries. If we join that, even that we don't have a lot of control except how we all those countries are bringing their production based on the economic factors on the international market to so determine the price of that. So it doesn't come from just one country or one state. All those countries coming together based on how much they are producing. If they produce more, it means that we have so much in stock. If they produce less, it means that the oil price has, it means that um, the production has dropped and the people will pay more to get the level that's available. So that's the dynamic. There was another question on the measures in place to make people accountable for the revenues that are coming into the country. So the Petroleum Revenue Management Act clearly states what all the stakeholders are supposed to be doing from when the money is reached government to when they are put in the various funds. And on a quarterly basis, the government is required to clearly state and publish in a gazette the amount of late change, the amount of money that have been made off those listings, and the allocations that have been made as well. At the end of the year, the Ministry of Finance publishes a petroleum revenue and holding funds report, a reconciliation report that also states all the projects that have received oil revenue over the year. So all these things go to show that the government is trying to be accountable for the revenues that have come in. It is also our role as civil society organizations and citizens to make sure that government is accountable. So we have to care, basically. Everyone has to care. We have to pay attention to how much is being lifted, how much is being sold on the world market, and how much revenues are coming into the country. That's the only way we'll be able to hold them accountable for the amount that's coming in and how they are using the money as well. And then the last question was, um, the organization responsible for fighting and oil. Who asked that question? 
the first person has to ask me, ask me to go to the in the country. So, um, so like you rightly said, there's no one organization that sets the price of oil. The price of oil like this are determined by factors of demand and supply. So as what demand that is available versus the amount of supply that is available. Now there are various things that happen worldwide that impact these things. For instance, there can be a ban on a country like Iran that says you are not allowed to sell your oil, your oil on the world market anymore. It happens. It reduced supply. When they started to um, respond to world demands of various things, and that ban was lifted, so supply increased. So then it affected the price. When America started its sale oil ventures and then supply increased, America became independent and reduced imports into its country. We saw world prices go down further because there was oversupply in the industry. Now, when the hurricanes happened in America, the recent ones, most of the refineries had to be shut down. We saw the price increase slightly from there. So you see that there's not one body that determines this thing, he says. When the world prices were plunging some time back, OPEC was, world players pleaded with OPEC to reduce their supply so that the price would increase and the business would become profitable again. OPEC being OPEC and two known OPEC that it is, the world to a bit of stress and refused to reduce their pricing because they were also benefiting from everything that's happening. When the price is high, they benefit and so on and so forth. So you need to also be aware of things that are happening globally to understand how these price changes trickle down into your country. Now you did not ask about the local setting of the prices, but all these things impact the oil of the price of oil and gas locally in your country. We have not gotten to the point where we refine and sell our own crude oil on our market as petroleum products. So we are still importing petroleum products as a country. So the price of the fuel you are buying at the pump is determined by various happenings worldwide. So when a political party comes to tell you that don't be strong, we're going to reduce oil prices, yada, 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 you know that it's not entirely accurate. You get it, because they do not have absolute control of the world prices. The best they can do is to put on tariffs and levies and take off these tariffs, tariffs and levies to make the prices more friendly to the consumer. Do we understand? Next question. Um, just before the next slide, I have to raise a the measures in place to hold government accountable. So, Africa Center for Energy Policy, we are able to cite the organization. And as part of our work, we do what we call value for money audits. So, we take, like, as Joanne was saying, reconciliation report publishes how much revenues have been received and what governments have used it for the different projects. So we take these reports and then we go to the field to check whether it is true. So if government says, okay, I built this irrigation dam in Upper East with this amount of money, we go there, we go to Upper East and go and see the irrigation dam. We go and hold interviews with the contractor and other stakeholders and find out how much money have you received. We come back to the Ministry of um, Finance or whichever and other steps, and let's say agriculture, and do further interviews with them to find out who this government says it's how much I have spent. Is that actually what's on the ground? So that is why it is important that you as citizens are also informed to know. When we bring out these reports, I'm not sure any of us know about the reconciliation reports. How many of us have been reading the reconciliation reports from government? We don't. But this is where the information about how we are spending the revenues are in. So you take it, and if you follow up on some of the work that we do now, you know about it, so you can go to our website, Oil Money TV, we put down some of the projects that we visited, and we have documentaries on them. Go and watch them and see exactly what is going there on there. So it can also be part of the government's trade. Okay? And so far, what we were talking, we were talking about the advantages oil has. Yet we know that um, looking at other countries, oil has destroyed part of their resources. And then I'm asking what government has, what measures government has put in place to control these damages. And then also looking on the slide, I've seen that the um, oil is supposed to bring wealth through active citizenship. Yet we've seen that Ghana doesn't have like 
Thank you. Um, there was an issue that came about, if I could try to remember, where they said we had an agreement in place with the Chinese, which was favoring them massively. The, the agreement was that they were to exploit our oil for us and take, and the, the majority of the, the revenue that was coming to come from the oil, they were to take that. So I'd like to know if that thing is true. If there was any agreement with the Chinese for them to exploit us in that way, and if so, why was Ghana taking such a less, such a lower amount from that agreement? Going into uh, um, its impact to the environment, and then, like some other countries, they are being compensated because uh, the oil sometimes spills and destroys some of their, uh, their natural habitats, like uh, the fishes in the, in the river. Sometimes there will be oil spillage in there. So, that, so they are being compensated and then given a percentage. But when we I didn't see any measure being put in place to avoid this. Madam, during the presentation, you uh, made it clear that in the future, the, the country can no longer depend on oil for revenue. That's why you have the Heritage Fund. So I was, I was wondering, as the Center for Energy Policy, what's the next take? Are you still going to rely on the Heritage Fund when there's no oil or you are having another energy policy in mind? Like, what's the next energy you want to work on? Is it, you get what I'm, I'm saying. Whether, it's the, whether I want to go into solar production or something else, I'm thinking, after oil is done, what next? With the country, yes. What are we going to rely on? With all these big figures coming from the oil center, where are we going after there's no oil? And on the four sections of on the four sections of uh, the revenue distribution, um, on the four sections of energy of revenue distribution, uh, I wanted to ask. So after a country has after three years, revised the four section and found out that probably it wasn't the right decision to do. Before three years, can they make am uh, amendments or probably just wait for another three years before they correct the mistake? Okay, thank you. I think someone has already asked part of my question. And then my question is that. Since we are not using our old tools and equipment or machinery for the drilling or maybe tapping our oil, how long is it going to take us to maybe depend on other people's or other countries' material for the drilling of the oil, where we are always giving them the lion's share of our profit or let me say our revenue? And then in other words, as when she was saying, said that the, 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 the oil resource or the price of the petroleum is volatile. And then in that, maybe the, the resource depends on the price of the petroleum. So if that's the case, can't we find a way of maybe uh, creating some kind of reserve so that we keep or store up uh, when the price goes there, and maybe when the uh, rise in the price of uh, petroleum, then we sell them out. So you see how you're holding the mic and you can only hear you. Yeah, you hear the mic, just for you. So this one is free damage, too free. Okay. So the first question was about oil destroying these sources. What government measures are there to control the damage? Okay, so one of the major concerns that any country has when they discover oil is the concern of use of care. Where you start exploiting your oil and then you begin to ignore all the other sectors of your economy and then you thrive in oil and the rest of your economy collapses. So then when there's any problem for one of the oil in the oil sector, your economy feels a lot of That's a Nigeria is a typical example. 
Before I do that, I cover the seven oil-laying dams. It was 12 exploders of granite that are up in the sky. Three oil-laying dams came into the picture. All of that collapsed. So what does that mean? That is one of the major reasons why government has the revenue management. To ensure that at every point in time, government pays attention to at least four other sectors of the economy. So that as you develop your oil and gas sector, you are developing the rest of your economy as well. That's what we call diversification. So you do not limit your economy to just one sector. And if you are somebody of the country that wants to depend or buy on only one sector of the economy. Now, you said, well, you are still taking the issue. How does that work when there is all the revenue given your chance to use foreign taxation? First of all, the government has not allowed countries to just come, build, and take everything away. So I'm tying that into your question about the Chinese coming in to take all the revenue. I honestly don't know where you get that. And we're just starting to use both of us can't pinpoint exactly what you're talking about. So there are lots of foreign countries that come to aid us in exploiting our oil. Most of these countries are free, most of these companies that come in from other countries are private international oil companies. Some of them are national oil companies. Now these companies have the financial capacity to do these activities. That is the position where as much as we would love to finance it ourselves, it costs millions and millions of dollars. You can have the upstream sector alone without finding anything yet, costing you hundreds of millions of dollars to build one well. Now ask yourself, is Ghana in the position to turn out all that amount of money to just be building wealth in the field and not finding anything? When you have schools like this that need to be built, when you have roads that need to be built, children need to go to school, need to build hospitals and all these things, it doesn't make sound financial sense to make such investments in drilling. So what we do is we invite other players who have the financial capacity to partake in these activities and we partner with them. So for every block that is sold, GMPC has a stake. Now GMPC stake in each um, activity ranges from about 10% to about 30-35%, depending on the contract they have and the type of exploration that is going to happen. These are things that you need to go on to the JNPC website to get more information about. So, I know that it's very nice and very easy for some political people to go around peddling some stories like for the government, depending on which government is in power, the government has allowed the foreign country to come and carry away all our revenue. So that is not necessarily the case. Now, when revenue comes into it, to the company after sales, government, you saw the sources of revenue to government. After all of this, government still makes money. Now, you cannot expect a foreign company to come in and drill for nothing. It's not a charity business. It goes so far away. This is a proper business that people are doing, so you cannot stop a company from making money where they are doing business. Can we appreciate that? Well, yes, we have to appreciate it. Now, that leads me to the last question that came from the gentleman at the back about if we know that the prices are going up and about and they are very volatile, why don't we force the oil? That's basically what they're asking. There are times where people have thought that hoarding the oil will help them and they will sell better at a higher price. But hoarding also impacts on demand and supply. So we hoard today because the price is low, thinking that the price will increase in the future. We hoard the price will be sell in the future. As soon as you release your inventory onto the market, the price is going to fall again. So really, is it really worth hoarding? These are the questions that economists struggle with every day and sometimes the forecasting works, sometimes it doesn't work. So there are a lot of factors that go into the case of that people are forced to be and go to more. Okay, so 
the issue about compensation for environmental degradation. Um, one of the reasons why I didn't see that in this is because for now, we are producing offshore. So we are producing not on the land, but deep waters off in the sea. Now, environmental degradation issues are very serious issues, especially when it comes from the oil industry. We heard of cases of oil spills and all that. And so there has been that call to ensure that these oil companies have in place health and safety and environmental regulations compliance with them, which they do. And the EPA is supposed to regulate that menstrual together with Petroleum Commission. But the dynamics will change if we start producing onshore. When we come onshore, and recently we have made certain discoveries onshore, and so there's that concern that has already been raised. We have what we call the environmental impact assessment. Can I have your attention? Okay. So the environmental impact assessment, what it does is that before you start any such project, what you are supposed to do is to evaluate it and assess how much impact it can have on people, on um, flora, on fauna, on settlement. And you put in place all your mitigating methods. So before you even start your project, you submit the issue. They have to come back and assess all the measures that they are put in place to ensure that in case there are any issues of the relation, this is how you are going to um, mitigate them. So for now, we don't have serious issues yet in our uh, offshore industry, but that doesn't mean that it's not a concern. We do have systems in place, but because we have not yet experienced any um, serious outbreak or even oil spills yet, but if these companies do have them in place, they are supposed to ensure that EPA regulates the petroleum commission regulation. But when we come on show, there are going to be issues of resettlement. There are people whose lands are going to be affected. And that's where compensation comes in. We have something that we call free trial informed consent, SPIC. So what government is supposed to do is that before they come on land, that um, production, whoever is supposed to be affected, they are supposed to go there. If I, before you enter my room, you have to know if I say come in before you come in. So the, once somebody has the land and is going to be impacted, you need to go and have consultations with the person. Even though the oil belongs to the government, once the person is on the land, you have to just have compensation issues to the person. So if you are going to resettle him, you have to make sure that you take the person to a place where he will be comfortable and have his land back. It was in his farm. You have to give the person back a, a very economic land that can go back to this farm. So these are the compensation issues that will play out. But when we do that, the onshore production, these are things that should be put in place before government has that producing. Okay, okay. So can we revise um, the four sector before the three years is up? Um, what the PRMA says is that within three years, they're supposed to prioritize four areas. So you don't start it and then within the three years, before it is up, you go back and then you want to revise the new. Unless you go and amend it. Unless you go back to amend the law. But because you cannot just go back to do that, you have to ensure that you wait after the three years. You do your assessment. If you realize that no, the decision that I made is in favor, you have to change your sections. But before the three years is up, you cannot go back and change it because the law says that it has to be within three years. Unless we, are, we amend the law and change the time frame that we have given it, but for now it's three years. So within three years, you have to make the decision that you make. After three years, then you revise it. Then after oil, what next? Like I mentioned earlier, oil is finite. It will not be there forever. And that is why you don't even wait for after oil before you now plan what to do. Like we saw there, we need to, and Juan also mentioned, we need to diversify our economy. Because oil will not be there forever. One day it will run out. That means that all the revenues that you are depending on today, tomorrow will not be there. And the heritage fund is not going to be enough to suffer for everything that you have used the oil revenues for. You cannot depend on it the way you depended on the revenues when it was trickling in at the time that you were producing. So diversification is very important. You need to build other sectors of the economy as much as you build the oil industry. 
And that is the reason why we are saying that it is important that when we are prioritizing these areas, we spend our oil revenue in sectors where we are going to have substantial um, developmental outcomes. So instead of just consuming the revenue now, build it into projects that can stay and have impact on future generations, on today's generation and future generations. So that is where the diversification also comes in. And apart from that, it's also important that when you, you um, have the oil revenue, you need to tell this again. How do you ensure that the revenues that I'm getting are not just pondering it? You must be disciplined enough. And that is one of the reasons why we have the PRMA, to guide how to spend the oil revenue. So that at the end of the day, you don't just take the money and squander on things that does not benefit the country. You have to ensure that whatever you are spending on, you discipline yourself. Stand in line with what the PRMA says, so that at the end of the day, you have those developmental outcomes that we intend. Let me just add to what you said. Um, aside this aspect of it, we expect that countries would also think beyond fossil fuel, like you were saying, venture into other renewable sources of energy. So there, there's been a whole global debate as to how long are we going to have oil around for. Previously, people thought that by the 2000s, oil would be running out. But over time, we've seen that Technology has advanced, skills have improved, we've gone further into the sea, and we are going deeper into the ground. And we are finding more sources of oil and gas. We are expanding things like shale, which was absolutely not there before, car sands, and many other things. So as much as we are worried that oil is finite, there are still many more years ahead of us in discovering and exploiting it. But because of various aspects such as greenhouse gases and climate change and all those things in between, some of the oil companies themselves know that their market share is going to be reducing because of these global requirements to reduce um, carbon dioxide emissions and stuff like that. So they themselves are venturing into projects of renewable sources. BP, for instance has a wing that is looking into these things. So we, the world is moving forward. Everybody is looking at various sources of energy aside oil and gas. So we also need to put our head in those areas as well. Thank you. So, fortunately or unfortunately, we've come to the end of our program. We've run out of time. We know that some of you had some more questions. Yeah, you didn't. That's not one day. Yeah. <laughs> so thank you very much. Please, I want uh, mm -hmm. who had uh, you know, the future some of our oil money to be added our oil money at all. So I want to see all these new volunteers, please, you have got our oil money to be those who have extended open education to use the international project. We want to advocate that government spend more of our money in promoting agriculture because agriculture is the way to reduce poverty. So we just want to hear your views. Those selected means we will use this part of our part of our agenda. Hello, my name is Nkroma Adom and Estina, and I'm a student. And I support the government investing oil revenue into agriculture in order to reduce poverty. Thank you. Hello, my name is Ubu Martins. I'm a, I'm a student of the University of Ghana, and I, I support the government, the government using the oil revenue to promote agriculture in order to reduce poverty in the country. Hi, my name is Ohima Dabanka, and I'm a student of the University of Ghana, Ligon. I support the government in using the oil revenue to support agriculture. Thank you. Hello.